Welcome everyone. We really appreciate your being here. Uh, this is, is really such an important topic and it touches on so many of the issues that ICUJP cares about and that uh, many of our separate uh, organizations and our own activities uh, deeply care about, but it has not been getting the attention of the mainstream corporate media. Um, the prosecution of Julian Assange is one of the most serious threats to freedom of the press in our lifetimes. Uh, it, it exceeds um, what happened in the Pentagon Papers case, given uh, the results of that case, uh, and the fact that uh, Daniel Ellsberg uh, was not sent to jail. Uh, it touches on questions of human rights, of the American prison system, of international law, uh, of the corruption of the CIA, uh, and of the undermining of uh, due process in the American legal system. Uh, it's that important. And um, we are speaking uh, at an important moment in the case, uh, which you'll learn about this morning. Uh, I couldn't have hoped uh, to be joined by uh, two other colleagues uh, who are so uh, conversant uh, in a deep and analytical and compassionate way on this uh, issue of Julian Assange uh, and all of the aspects that it uh, touches. Uh, I'm going to outline our program uh, briefly, uh, and then we'll be uh, turning to each of our speakers in rotation. Uh, Marjorie Cohen, who uh, has spoken here before, is a retired criminal defense attorney, professor emerita at Thomas Jefferson School of Law, former president of the National Lawyers Guild, uh, and a member of the Bureau of the International Association of Democratic Lawyers. Uh, Marjorie lectures, writes, and provides commentary for local regional, national, and international media outlets. She's a regular contributor to Truth Out, where you can go and read her very incisive, timely columns. Uh, and she is a member of the advisory board of uh, Assange Defense. Uh, and she has a website that is linked to the announcement for today's program. Carrie Shankman is a constitutional lawyer, author, and litigator focusing on freedom of expression. He has a particular focus on the Espionage Act of 1917, which is at the center of the prosecution of Julian Assange. Uh, Carrie is co-authoring a forthcoming volume on the Espionage Act and its impact on freedom of speech and dissent over the last century. Uh, before we began, I learned that that uh, book is in final editing and will be published in the spring. Carrie works with numerous free speech and human rights organizations and serves on the board of the Calix Institute, a digital rights nonprofit in New York. He previously worked for the late constitutional lawyer and my Columbia Law School classmate, Michael Ratner, uh, who defended truth tellers, including Julian Assange. Uh, I am Steve Rohde, chair of this extraordinary uh, organization and active with the ACLU, Ben the Ark, uh, the Black Jewish Justice Alliance, and Death Penalty Focus. Uh, it seems to me that um, the Julian Assange case uh, is, a, is a crucible of all of the intersections of the failures of American foreign policy and uh, domestic uh, criminal law uh, over the last several decades. Um, WikiLeaks was founded uh, in October of 2006, 
it was a visionary project of Julian Assange to gather documents, uh, to make them freely accessible to the public, to other journalists, to publications, and largely that mission has been carried out through the amazing uh, information that WikiLeaks has released to the public uh, over those uh, 15 years. Uh, WikiLeaks was uh, hard at work doing its job uh, as a publisher and Julian Assange as a journalist. Uh, when in April of 2010, it made a major release of documents. Uh, I remember uh, us showing the video collateral murder at a meeting of ICUJP. I can visualize the darkened room, the screen off to the right. This shocking video of US uh, helicopters shooting down innocent people, uh, some of them Reuters reporters uh, whose uh, cameras uh, were, I believe, uh, intentionally mistaken for weapons, uh, and the return volleys of these US uh, mercenary helicopters uh, killing innocent people and returning to kill those who came and rescue. And we'll talk more about collateral murder and all of the documents that WikiLeaks uh, released that gave a view into the war crimes that the United States was committing. Uh, the outline for today uh, will be for Marjorie to give us the basic history of the subsequent prosecution of uh, WikiLeaks and specifically Julian Assange, uh, tracing it through three presidential uh, administrations, from the Obama administration to the Trump administration to the Biden administration. Uh, Marjorie will outline the real nature of the information that WikiLeaks released, uh, and she'll give us a uh, timetable of where the case stands and an important appellate hearing in England uh, that is coming up uh, because the United States sought the extradition of Julian Assange, having uh, indicted him under the Espionage Act of uh, 1917, and although the British judge, as you'll hear, denied the extradition request uh, in the first days of this year, the Biden administration is perpetuating that prosecution by appealing that ruling, and you'll hear more about that. We'll then turn to Carrie for an in-depth look at the history of the Espionage Act of 1917, this infamous law, some of the key prosecutions that have occurred under that act, and the truly unprecedented nature of the Assange prosecution itself. We'll turn back to Marjorie to summarize uh, the extradition hearings, which took place a, a year ago, uh, last September, and the January 4 ruling, uh, highlighting some of the witnesses in that extraordinary extradition hearing and the findings with a particular focus on the human rights findings and the risk of suicide uh, that the court found. Uh, then Carrie will return to look at the extradition rulings, ticking time bomb findings on free press and the exemptions to extradition. And then Marjorie will uh, finish our uh, formal presentation by looking at recent revelations that the CIA and Mike Pompeo uh, were planning uh, to detain and to assassinate Julian Assange and some of the serious due process problems in that prosecution. 
We're going to try to accomplish all of that and leave time for questions and answers. And we will talk at the end about what each of you can do today and tomorrow and in these coming weeks uh, to end the persecution of Julian Assange. So it's really a pleasure. These are two wonderful people that I've been working with on the Assange Defense Committee uh, for the last several years. Uh, and I think all of us are in for a treat. So I'll turn the program over to Marjorie. Thank you, Steve, so much. And to ICUJP for inviting me to participate in this important program. And I'm also honored to be co-presenting with Carrie. And uh, so let's get started. So why are the revelations by Julian Assange and WikiLeaks so threatening to the US government that Julian Assange is facing 175 years in prison in the event he is extradited to the United States, tried and convicted. In 2010 and 2011, WikiLeaks published evidence of war crimes that the US military had committed in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Guantanamo. The disclosures included 400,000 field reports about the Iraq war, 15,000 unreported deaths of Iraqi civilians, and evidence of the systematic torture, murder, and rape after US forces handed over detainees to a notorious Iraq, Iraqi torture squad. WikiLeaks also published the Afghan war logs, which were 90,000 reports about the war in Afghanistan, revealing more civilian casualties by coalition forces than the US military had admitted to. And the disclosures included the Guantanamo files, 779 secret reports showing that 150 innocent people had been imprisoned there for years and documenting the US government's torture and abuse of 800 men and boys in violation of the Geneva Conventions and the Convention Against Torture and other cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. Both of those treaties have been ratified by the United States, making them part of US law under the Supremacy Clause of the Constitution, which says treaties shall be the supreme law of the land, which means that the US is bound by its obligations in those treaties. Perhaps the most notable release by WikiLeaks, as Steve has pointed out, was the 2007 collateral murder video. It depicts a US Army Apache helicopter gunship in Baghdad, target and fire on unarmed civilians. At least 18 civilians were killed, including two Reuters journalists and a man who tried to rescue the wounded. Two children were injured. And then a US Army tank drove over one of the bodies, severing it in half. The collateral murder video contains evidence of three separate war crimes under the Geneva Conventions. Now, Barack Obama prosecuted more whistleblowers than all of his predecessors combined. But after impaneling a grand jury and pondering about whether to indict Julian Assange, the Obama administration made the decision not to file an indictment because of what is known as the New York Times problem. And that is the First Amendment, freedom of expression, freedom of press, requires that journalists be allowed to pursue their craft, even disclosing classified information. And Kerry is going to describe that. And the Obama administration concluded that if it prosecuted Julian Assange, then the New York Times and the Washington Post and Der Spiegel and Le Monde 
and The Guardian and other newspapers that did just what WikiLeaks did would also have to be prosecuted. So Obama decided not to prosecute Assange. Donald Trump, however, did file an indictment against Assange under the Espionage Act, which Kerry is going to describe. And those charges, as I said, could result in 175 years in custody uh, for Julian Assange. Now, a district court judge in the UK denied Donald Trump's request to extradite Assange to the United States for trial on the indictment. Because, the judge said, Judge Baratzer, that by holding him in the conditions that he would be held in supermax prison, uh, practically in isolation, given his fragile mental state, he would be in great danger of <clears throat> committing suicide and the US prison system could not protect him. So the Trump administration, as they were on their way out, filed an appeal appealing the denial of extradition. When Joe Biden came into power, instead of dismissing the Trump appeal and dismissing the case against Julian Assange, which Obama would have done, the Obama-Biden administration, Biden likes to tout his, uh, you know, his uh, inclusion in the Obama administration, use that throughout the campaign. Barack and I did this, Barack and I did that. But he has taken a different tact and pursued with vigor the appeal that Trump filed against the denial of extradition. In other words, Biden is trying to, is, is continuing Trump's attempt to get Assange extradited to the United States so he can be tried uh, under these Espionage Act charges. Now, next week on October 27th and 28th, the UK High Court, which is an appellate court, will hear the appeal of the Biden administration in this case. And at that hearing, the High Court should determine what effect the CIA's newly revealed plans to kidnap and assassinate Assange will have on his fragile mental state in the event he is extradited to the United States. And a little bit later in the program, I will discuss what the CIA was planning during the Trump administration. The UK High Court will decide whether to affirm or overturn District Judge Baratzer's decision denying the extradition of Julian Assange to the United States. If the High Court affirms Baratzer's ruling, the Biden administration could appeal to the UK Supreme Court and ask them to review the case. That's discretionary. They don't have to review it, but they can. But if the High Court overturns Baratzer's decision, Assange could appeal to the UK Supreme Court. And if he loses there, he could take the case to the European Court of Human Rights. Now, in a disturbing and unusual development, two judges, two appellate judges, Lord Justice Timothy Holroyd and Justice Dame Judith Farby, the same judges who allowed Biden to expand the grounds of his appeal against Assange, those two judges will be part of the three judge panel that will judge the appeal next week. Stay tuned. Thank you, Marjorie, so much. Let's dig deeper into this uh, uh, nefarious Espionage Act of 1917, rearing its head uh, over a hundred years later. Uh, take us into that history and the unprecedented nature of the Assange prosecution, Carrie. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, it's wonderful to see you all. Thank you so much for having me. And I think Steve uh, understated his own contributions to not only the advocacy around this case and the public education, but also um, the years of work around freedom of expression issues. I, I really recommend um, for a deeper look 
on, on these issues, um, both Steve and Marjorie's writings, because it, it's, it's, it, it's really been um, incredible and much needed. So I was gonna give a brief presentation on, on the history of the Espionage Act, doing my best because it's, it's a very complex and, and, and very, uh, very confusing law actually, even among uh, legal experts. But I'll try to touch upon the main points and everyone can see uh, my screen. All right, so the Espionage Act of 1917, in my view, it's the most important yet least understood law impacting our right to know. It was initially passed shortly after U.S. entry into World War I with a preamble to punish acts of interference with the foreign relations, the neutrality, and the foreign commerce of the United States to punish espionage and to better enforce the criminal laws of the United States and for other purposes. And I think this really frames what the Espionage Act is about. You notice that the word Espionage Act doesn't even appear until the second line. This is primarily about interference with the foreign relations. And we see that throughout the history of the act. So what does this law do? It broadly punishes the receipt, retention, and communication of what's called national defense information. Historically, it's been the key law used to prosecute government whistleblowers and media sources. And importantly, even though it's called the Espionage Act, it is not limited to spies. So a spy is, we would commonly understand, someone who is in the employ of a foreign government to try to obtain secret information from the US. It's not limited to spies. It can apply to government employees, members of the general public, so anyone on this call, even non-US citizens, as we see in the Assange prosecution. So the first thing you might ask is, well, it prosecutes a disclosure of national defense information. Nobody on this call is disclosing national defense information. That, that, that sounds like pretty important stuff, doesn't it? Um, well, that's really important point to note. National defense information does not mean military secrets, codes, or closely guarded information. It doesn't even need to mean classified information. It can include and has included evidence of torture, war crimes, corruption, or government criminality. A brief overview of its history. So as I mentioned, the law was passed during World War I to limit opposition to the war. Uh, Woodrow Wilson was initially opposed to US entry in World War I, but that uh, changed in 1917. And at the time, he also wanted to create criminal penalties for anyone who is obstructing enlistment in the armed forces or causing insubordination or disloyalty in the military. There are also provisions in the initial Espionage Act that provided for banning of publications from the mails. This was used for critical publications. It was also amended in 1918 to include the First Sedition Act in uh, over a century and a half. That was since repealed. And the act was amended numerous times, expanded in 1950 at the height of McCarthyism to what we see today. I won't go over every single provision of the Espionage Act because there's many different provisions that are quite complex, but I do want to highlight what is perhaps the most controversial, which is Section 793E, and it's among the charges uh, which Julian Assange faces in his indictment. So what 793E does is it criminalizes whoever having unauthorized possession of any document relating to the national defense or information relating to the national defense, which information the possessor has reason to believe could be used to the injury of the United States or the advantage of any foreign nation, willfully communicates the same to any person not entitled to receive it, shall be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than 10 years or both. And importantly, that 10 years is 10 years per count of the act. And that's why, as uh, Marjorie pointed out, uh, Sanja's facing 175 years because in these prosecutions, each disclosure of a single document or a single piece of information can be charged as a separate crime, as a separate count, or even multiple acts, alleged acts surrounding the same information. So the obtaining the information, the publishing of the information can be double charged in effect. So looking at this language, suppose someone on this call um, 
receives evidence of of U.S. war crimes, and that's information that the government would not want you to be in possession of. So in the Justice Department's view, you might be an unauthorized possession of, of that information. And if that information is published, say it's shared on social media or tweeted, well, that's willfully communicated. And members of the public are people not entitled to receive that information. So we can see just how broad this language is. It's not limited to spies not even limited to government insiders, but it could apply to potentially anyone. And for that reason, historically, it's been a very contentious and controversial law. A prominent law professor, Stephen Vladek, called it anachronistic, labyrinthine, constitutionally problematic, and confusingly verbose. In their seminal study of the law, uh, professors Harold Edgar and Benno Schmidt Jr., who's a former dean of Columbia uh, Law School, as well as um, president of Yale stated that public speech in this country since World War II has been rife with criminality. Law professor Jeffrey Stone, who's a First Amendment scholar, stated that the Espionage Act definitely should be repealed and replaced, um, sorry, let me put that, replaced by legislation that reflects what we've learned over the past century. Significantly, just in this past year, there's a consortium of academics that included former national security officials, former Attorney General Eric Holder Jr. and former CIA Director John Brennan. What's significant about Eric Holder, that his Justice Department was the Justice Department that initially investigated Julian Assange and declined to pursue charges. He was actually part of this consortium that said that the current system for punishing leakers is ineffective, resulting in both excessive punishment and under deterrence that the Espionage Act should be amended to make clear that the press cannot be prosecuted for core journalistic activity. The CIA's own uh, general, former general counsel in 1977 stated that the law's provisions are vague and clumsy in their wording, and they feed into bureaucratic tendencies to overclassify, undoubtedly fed by the flipperiness and classification occasional efforts to conceal embarrassing mistakes or something worse behind bogus national security claims. Finally, a uh, conservative-leaning professor at Georgetown University Law Center stated that the law should be amended or reinterpreted to provide more recognition of the crucial difference between classic and technology press leaks. So the criticism and controversy around this law is not something that's confined to those in social justice spaces. It's really a bipartisan, really among national security officials as well, among all walks of political life. There's great criticism of the vagueness of this law. So I mentioned that it was passed during World War I, during one of the most uh, politically uh, repressive periods in US history. When the industrial workers of the world were at their height, the Socialist Party was at its height. And there was great effort to suppress dissent and opposition to the war. And in fact, among the first 2,000 prosecutions under the Espionage Act, none of them were of spies. They were all for opposing the U.S. entry into the war and U.S. actions in the war. One of the most famous defendants... Oh, Steve, did you want to... Yeah, Carrie, uh, Sophia, would you uh, go mute, please? And everyone who's not speaking. Please go on mute, Sophia, and everyone who's not speaking. OK. There's a lot of noise. Thank you. Uh, all right, I think that's that, that's better. So one of the most famous defendants under the Espionage Act uh, originally was, was Eugene Debs, who is Socialist Party candidate uh, for president. And he gave a famous 
protest speech, um, probably one of the most famous uh, speeches of dissent uh, in US history, and was actually charged under the Espionage Act for that speech, for advocating for disloyalty. In fact, he was accused of inciting his audience to interfere with military recruitment. And his case, um, he was eventually pardoned, but it led to a, a very prominent prosecution. So this initial period, I, I think, frames the history in the next 100 years of what we see under the Espionage Act, which is an effort to stifle dissent and stifle what's perceived to be any interference or criticism of US foreign policy during wartime. The Espionage Act to this day has never successfully been used against the publisher for obtaining or publishing secrets. The prosecution of Julian Assange is the most aggressive attempt in US history to do so. And of course, this is a serious threat to the First Amendment. There's only a handful of times that the Justice Department under various administrations has attempted to go after publishers. One was during World War II, when the Chicago Tribune uh, published a story after the US uh, victory at the Battle of Midway. You'll see at the center of the screen at the bottom, this story with the headline, Navy had word of Jap plan to strike at sea. Uh, this, this story, uh, stated that, that the U.S. knew about the composition of, of the Japanese fleet in advance of this battle. And as a result, a grand jury investigation was convened against the Tribune reporter, uh, Stanley Johnston, on, on the right, and his editor, uh, Lloyd Maloney. So they were actually dragged before dra a grand jury and, and forced to testify what was really interesting about this case was that the Tribune was actually a political nemesis of FDR. They uh, opposed the New Deal, and FDR had previously investigated the Chicago Tribune. So this case was uh, widely considered not only within the Tribune, but, but broad, more broadly than that, to be very politically motivated. Ultimately, the case fell apart for a number of reasons. There was a lot of conflict within the Justice Department about whether about the constitutionality of prosecuting, not, not the source of the story, but the journalist and the newspaper that published it. So it ultimately fell apart. We didn't see major attempts to go after the press until some decades later, when, of course, we know the Pentagon Papers case. This was the original story when the New York Times published uh, the first uh, excerpts from the Pentagon Papers. And their source famously was Daniel Ellsberg, who was prosecuted in federal court in Los Angeles. Of course, the case against him fell apart, but not without implications for the press. So Nixon and his Justice Department actually restrained the press, meaning that they prevented the New York Times or attempted to prevent the New York Times the Post and other papers from publishing the Pentagon Papers. It was unprecedented in US history for an administration to actively censor the press. This case ended up going to the Supreme Court in a prominent Supreme Court case, New York Times versus the United States. But in addition to that, the administration also convened a grand jury in Boston that was investigating journalists, academics, and others even weighing charges against the New York Times. There is a lesser known investigation of Beacon Press, which is the publishing arm of the Unitarian Universalist Association, which published the full papers. No journalists were ultimately charged. Fast forward to the Obama administration, as Marjorie pointed out, more media sources were criminally charged under that administration than all presidents before combined. Some of those media sources included Chelsea Manning, Edward Snowden, uh, Thomas Drake of the NSA, uh, Stephen Kim, the State Department, Jeffrey Sterling, the CIA. Journalists were increasingly implicated in, in these cases as well. So there's a breakthrough story that came out that Associated Press journalists had their phone records seized. 
James Risen of the New York Times. He was attempted to, um, there was an attempt to force him to testify in the prosecution of Jeffrey Sterling. And also Fox's James Rosen was named a criminal co-conspirator in court documents in the Stephen Kim case. So we see increasingly we're moving closer to this line of criminally implicating the press and dragging yeah. publishers and journalists into the criminal uh, into the criminal system. It was also under the Obama administration that a grand jury was convened against Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. But as Marjorie pointed out, the decision was made not to prosecute because of the New York Times problem. So now we're faced, what are the key issues with this law? What's at stake? One of the biggest problems is that the language of the Espionage Act applies to anyone, even those who have signed no confidentiality agreement with the US government. There's no opportunity to have a fair trial. There's no opportunity to argue that public interest is served by disclosure. It's selectively enforced. Government officials leak national defense information every day to no consequence, often to their political benefit, but it's only critics that are prosecuted. There's a stigma around prosecutions, particularly because the law is called the Espionage Act. So defendants are often branded as traitors, as spies. You've probably heard of Edward Snowden being called a traitor of, of government officials who become whistleblowers. Of, of being accused of being traitors. And this subject, subjects them within the legal system to very harsh and inhumane treatment. We saw just recently Daniel Hill, who is um, convicted under the Espionage Act, was just in this last week. Um, he, he, he was a alleged source of um, human rights violations surrounding the drone program. He was put in a communication, what's called a communication management unit, which is a, a very oppressive, uh, restrictive um, and, and inhumane um, form of confinement where basically someone's contact with the outside world is, is effectively cut off, even from legal counsel. Finally, prosecutions are typically brought in a venue called the Eastern District of Virginia, which is uh, known as the national security venue. Very unsympathetic judges and most of the jury pools are pulled from, uh, from individuals working in the national security space. What are the implications of prosecuting a publisher under the Espionage Act? It means that investigative journalism is in effect turned into a felony. For example, journalists obtaining information from a source might be by a violation of section 793B and C, which criminalize uh, aspects of obtaining and the receipt of national defense information. In addition, a source disclosing information to a journalist might be a violation of section 793D, and a journalist's role in interacting with a source might also be charged not only under 793D, but under the conspiracy provision of the Espionage Act 793G. In addition to that, the journalist publishing national defense information to violate section 793E. And we might think, well, this sounds all three theoretical, doesn't it? The idea of a, someone who's not a government employee, not a US citizen who hasn't signed a confidentiality agreement being charged under all these counts for the same conduct. But these are among the charges in the Assange indictment. In fact, the implications of this case led investigative uh, journalist and documentary filmmaker, uh, Laura Portress, who uh, was among the journalists who published the original Snowden revelations in 2013, to pen a uh, prominent New York Times uh, piece stating, I am guilty of violating the Espionage Act. And I really recommend this piece. I, I think it's, it's quite powerful and highlights a lot of the issues at stake in this case. She starts off powerfully saying, I am guilty of violating the Espionage Act, Title 18, U.S. Code, Section 793 and 798. If charged and convicted, I could spend the rest of my life in prison. This is not a hypothetical. Right now, the United States government is prosecuting a publisher under the Espionage Act 
The case could set a precedent that would put me and countless other journalists in danger. So in sum, we've seen how the act is contentious and controversial in the legal community. It's never been used before until now to prosecute, uh, prosecute a publisher for obtaining and publishing secrets. There's no opportunity to mount an effective defense, no opportunity to argue that disclosures serve the public interest to reveal the US crimes. And its reach is potentially limitless. The New York Times, the Post, or any media organization is not immune. Wow, Carrie, that is easily the most comprehensive, detailed, and informative presentation I have ever seen on the espionage of <laughs> Uh, 1917. I'm so glad this program is being recorded for future viewing. Let's now turn to this uh, extraordinary extradition hearing uh, in England as the Trump administration uh, doggedly pursued uh, Julian Assange. Uh, take us to those uh, hearings, uh, Marjorie, uh, and the eventual ruling on January 4. Yes, um, first I wanna say that Carrie, I can't wait to read your book. Um, I, I agree with Steve, an incredibly effective presentation. On January the 4th of this year, UK District Judge Vanessa Baratzer denied Donald Trump's request for the extradition of Julian Assange to the United States ruling that he was at high risk of committing suicide if he were extradited because the United States prison system could not keep him safe. But at the same time, Baratzer spent most of her 132 page decision supporting the Trump administration's case against Assange, which Kerry will explain amounts to the criminalization of national security journalism. Baratzer denied the Assange defense arguments under the European Court of European Convention on Human Rights, Article 7, which protects against arbitrary prosecution, conviction, and punishment. Um, Baratzer said, don't worry, Assange's human rights will be protected by the Fifth Amendment due process right in the US Constitution in the event he were extradited and tried. And she also rejected the Assange defense argument under Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights, which protects freedom of expression by saying, don't worry, the First Amendment to the US Constitution will protect Julian Assange in the event he is extradited and tried under these charges. The UK 2003 Extradition Act forbids extradition if the physical or mental condition of the person is such that it would be unjust or oppressive to extradite him. If Assange is extradited to the United States, the judge found, he would be incarcerated in a US supermax prison and held in solitary confinement for 23 hours a day under onerous conditions. Baratzer relied heavily on the written testimony of Professor Michael Koppelman, the Emeritus Professor of Neuropsychiatry at King's College in London, who diagnosed Assange with recurrent depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. Baratzer cited Koppelman's assertion, quote, I am as confident as a psychiatrist ever can be that if, if extradition to the United States were to become imminent, Mr. Assange will find a way of suiciding, unquote. Baratzer noted that other experts who testified in the extradition hearing corroborated Koppelman's predictions of suicide. Baratzer wrote, the detention conditions in which Mr. Assange is likely to be held are relevant to Mr. Assange's risk of suicide. And she cited the testimony by prison experts in the US as well as mental health experts. If he were sent to the US, Assange would face incarceration under onerous 
special administrative measures, leaving him in virtual isolation from all other human beings. Thus, Baratzer found, faced with conditions of near total isolation and without the protective factors which moderate his risk at the Belmarsh prison, where Assange is currently being held in London, I am satisfied that the procedures described by Dr. Lukefeld will not prevent Mr. Assange from finding a way to commit suicide. She concluded, I am satisfied that the risk Mr. Assange will commit suicide is a substantial one. I find that the mental condition of Mr. Assange is such that it would be oppressive to extradite him to the United States of America. On August 11th, Lord Justice Holroyd and Justice Dame Judith Farby overruled the July 5th decision of Justice Jonathan Swift, they're all on the high court, and expanded Biden's grounds for appeal. At the appeals hearing next week, the high court will now be permitted to second guess Baratzer's reliance on Koppelman's testimony in determining the severity of Assange's mental condition. The Biden administration is arguing that Baratzer should have disregarded Koppelman's evidence or accorded it less weight because he didn't write in his first report that Assange had a partner, Stella Morris, and they had two young children together. Although Koppelman knew about them, he was mindful of Morris's anxiety about her children's privacy. Both Koppelman's subsequent report and his testimony at the extradition hearing referred to Morris and their children. By then, it was public knowledge. Baratzer considered both of Koppelman's reports as well as his testimony before making her ruling. Baratzer wrote, Koppelman assessed Mr. Assange during the period May to December 2019 and was best placed to consider at first hand his symptoms. He has taken great care to provide an informed account of Mr. Assange's background and psychiatric history. He has given close attention to the prison medical notes and provided a detailed summary annexed to his December report. He is an experienced clinician and he was well aware of the possibility of exaggeration and malingering. I had no reason to doubt his clinical opinion. Holroyd and Farby also allowed Biden to expand his appeal by presenting now after the extradition hearing assurances that if extradited to the United States, Assange will not be held in uh, maximum security prison or subject to those special administrative measures unless his behavior so warrants it. So that's an out, it's a conditional assurance. And the US has given assurances that it will not object to Assange serving any prison time he might receive in the event he is extradited tried and convicted, he will, they will not object to him serving his time in custody in Australia. Of course, the US cannot force Australia to accept Assange, uh, Assange and uh, imprison him. But those assurances, which could well have been made in the extradition hearing are now being made at the 11th hour. And these two judges who are two out of the three on the appellate panel next week have allowed Biden to expand the grounds for his appeal. Regardless of whether the high court reweighs the Koppelman evidence, they should give considerable weight to the way in which explosive new revelations of the Trump administration's plot to kidnap and Assange, which I will describe later, will affect his mental health if he is extradited. So next week's hearing is extremely important and uh, stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you, Marjorie. Let's pause here before we turn back to Carrie because I wanna be sure our audience understands what we know of Julian Assange's uh, 
emotional and mental condition. Uh, if you're able, uh, Marjorie, we didn't dwell on his, um, his asylum at the Ecuadorian embassy and now his imprisonment uh, in the Belmarsh prison. Could you just summarize how long has Julian Assange been in one or another form of custody uh, and what has, uh, has been the nature of that uh, to the extent that a UN rapporteur uh, has issued a report as well? Yes, Julian Assange received asylum in the Ecuadorian embassy in London and spent seven years there. And while he was there, um, he had some very serious health problems and health conditions, but the British government, working hand in glove with the US government, would not guarantee that if he were to leave the Ecuadorian embassy to go to a hospital, that the UK police would not arrest him. And that, uh, prompted the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture and Other Cruel, Inhuman, and Degrading Treatment, Niles Melser, to determine after examining Assange and spending quite a bit of time with him that he had been subjected to prolonged psychological torture. And this, and then he spent another two years after he, well, let me just back up. The um, government in Ecuador changed, a pro-US president came into power, withdrew Assange's grant of asylum. The UK police in London moved in quickly and arrested Assange, basically dragged him out of the Ecuadorian embassy to give the US government time to publicize its indictment and request extradition to the United States. And so what the UK government did was to charge Julian Assange with violating his bail conditions, which were actually his lawful actions in support of his lawful right to apply for asylum. And they kept him in custody uh, in, uh, for that bail jumping, basically, uh, uh, charge. He was convicted of that, sentenced to about a year in prison. He's been in the Belmarsh high security prison in London for another two years. And this is the backstory on why Julian Assange um, has a frail, frail mental health and it's because of his conditions of confinement over the last nine to 10 years. Thank you, Marjorie. I, I want people to, to add up those numbers. This man has already uh, been uh, in asylum and in prison for nine years. This prosecution by the United States government has already had this punitive deterrent effect on Julian Assange, irrespective of what becomes of this prosecution itself. Kerry, I would like you to uh, come back with us because we've alluded to findings and conclusions uh, by uh, Judge uh, Barrett, sir, in the extradition hearing, uh, which if they were to stand, if the uh, underlying decision to deny extradition were overturned, uh, these findings as they relate to freedom of the press and the exemptions from the extradition treaties uh, for a political defense uh, would stand. And I want our audience to understand those issues as well. Thank you, Kerry. Absolutely, Steve. Um, I think this is one of the, the core issues behind this case and, and where I was going with my presentation is that the Espionage Act of 1917 is at its core a political law. It was passed for political reasons. It was passed to stifle dissent. And the reason that's significant is that political offenses are one of the core exclusions from extradition. An individual cannot be extradited for political reasons due to a political law or politically motivated prosecution. What we've seen, and I'll, I'll actually make a, a disclaimer here is that I, I testified uh, on this point in the, uh, in the extradition proceedings 
the one of the biggest uh, criticisms of this prosecution is the widely held belief that it is politically motivated because a decision was made not to prosecute under one presidential administration and subsequent to that, the using the same facts, the exact same evidence, the exact same allegations, a different conclusion was reached under the next administration. And I, I think the, the obvious question there is, well, what, what changed besides the political circumstances? And in fact, the political <laughs> administration is the only difference. Uh, so I think at, at its core, that really shows the motivation behind, uh, behind the case. In my view, the prosecution under the Espionage Act is, is political in nature. You, you can't have a, a prosecution um, like this that, that, that's not political. The, the law itself is inherently uh, susceptible to abuse and overreach. So I think the implications, if, if the decision are, were to be overturned, uh, would, be, would be very grave. It would allow there to be extraterritorial reach of this US law to effectively anyone in the world. It would give the United States the ability to seek the extradition of anyone in the world from, from any country, I mean, a, assuming their legal system uh, doesn't stand up uh, to this, but the United Kingdom is a is a established and respected common law legal system. So it's difficult to see that not uh, setting a um, at least a um, uh, informal precedent that's authoritative um, to some degree under uh, under uh, international law for um, and that's something that I think Marjorie can comment on as well. So I, I, I do think that the political. Your screen is frozen. We're not hearing your audio. This is such a pity. Um, let's do the following. I hope uh, you'll see this for yourself and rejoin us as soon as possible. And we'll pick up right there. Uh, let me use this opportunity uh, to bring Marjorie in on these very issues. Uh, the US government is purporting to give the Extradition Act uh, extraterritorial reach to reach a journalist who is Australian and uh, working elsewhere and in England on the one hand, and are publicly denying him uh, the protection of the First Amendment. Uh, can you discuss that with us briefly? Yes, um, this is a hypocritical stance that the US government is taking. And if Assange is ultimately extradited to the United States and stands trial on this indictment, uh, I have no doubt that the U.S. government will also um, poo-poo the First Amendment argument. And as Kerry said, um, the prosecution of a publisher for revealing classified information um, is, is unprecedented. This is the first time. Um, so yes, there is a great deal of hypocrisy in the U.S. government's uh, position in this case. Harry, welcome back. I'm glad you. I'm so sorry this. about that. My uh, my computer suddenly died. Um, I, I apologize, oh. but I was I was at the end of my point. <laughs> so, well, we expanded on it. Uh, and by the way, you're the first person to ever have any technical difficulties uh, in the last year and a half. Uh, I wanted your thoughts on this this inconsistency. Didn't hasn't Mike Pompeo and other U.S. officials claimed that uh, Assange has no First Amendment defense, but by the same token, they are giving the uh, Extradition Act uh, extraterritorial reach uh, to reach a foreign uh, journalist uh, operating outside the United States. Agreed. I, I think this is, uh, this is a point that hasn't received enough attention 
in my view, because the, the U.S. is trying to have its cake and, and eat it too, simultaneously claiming that this law has limitless reach, but at the same time that the defenses have limits. And I think that's uh, one of the biggest problems with the Espionage Act and these prosecutions is that the, the cards are really stacked against defendants. There's no opportunity to argue public interest. Uh, there's a deeply biased venue in the Eastern District of Virginia, and unsympathetic judges. And as you point out, there's also efforts to remove the basic constitutional protections uh, guaranteed under the Bill of Rights, under the First Amendment. I mean, the idea that somebody could be criminally prosecuted anywhere in the world but not enjoy protection of the First Amendment is, is frankly absurd. But this is this appears to be what the U.S. is seeking, which is fundamentally uh, in conflict with uh, with basic guarantees of due process. Thank you. And if this wasn't bad enough, if this was not such a politically motivated uh, prosecution, uh, we've now had two recent revelations that Marjorie will discuss. Uh, one involves a key witness uh, that the US government promoted and sponsored uh, to testify against Julian Assange, uh, who has now recanted his testimony, and uh, Marjorie will discuss that. And then the more recent revelations of what Mike Pompeo and the CIA were doing behind the scenes. Marjorie. The US indictment of Julian Assange stems from WikiLeaks 2010 through 2011 revelations of US war crimes in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Guantanamo. But it was WikiLeaks publication of CIA hacking tools known as Vault 7, which the CIA called the largest data loss in CIA history, that incurred the wrath of Trump's CIA director, Mike Pompeo. In 2017, Pompeo called WikiLeaks a non-state hostile intelligence service and CIA and government officials hatched secret war plans to abduct and kill Assange, according to a stunning new report by Zach Dorfman, uh, Sean Naylor, and Michael Isakoff, published on September 26th in Yahoo News. Some senior CIA and Trump administration... <laughs> Some senior CIA and Trump administration officials requested sketches or options for ways to assassinate Assange. And Trump himself, quote, asked whether the CIA could assassinate Assange and provide him options for how to do so, unquote, according to the Yahoo News report. Pompeo advocated extraordinary rendition of Assange, which the CIA used in its war on terror to illegally seize suspects and send them to black sites where they were subjected to torture. The scenario was that the CIA would break into the Ecuadorian embassy in which Assange was staying under a grant of asylum and clandestinely fly him to the United States to stand trial. But others in the CIA wanted to assassinate Assange outright by poisoning or shooting him to avoid the hassle of kidnapping. The CIA spied on WikiLeaks, which was aimed at sowing discord among the group's members and stealing their electronic devices. The CIA also conducted illegal surveillance inside the Ecuadorian embassy and spied on privileged attorney-client communications between Assange and his lawyers. Concerned that the CIA might kidnap or kill Assange, which could jeopardize a potential criminal prosecution, the Department of Justice filed a secret indictment against him in 2018. To bolster 
the Justice Department's case for ex extradition, the FBI collaborated with informant Siggy Thordarson, a sociopath and convicted pedophile, to paint Assange as a hacker instead of a journalist, so he would not have the First Amendment protection. Thor Darson later admitted to the Icelandic newspaper Stunden that he lied about Assange being a hacker in return for immunity from prosecution by the FBI. In 2019, as I said, after a new pro-US president came to power in Ecuador, in order to facilitate the US extradition process, the London police dragged Assange from the embassy and arrested him for violating bail conditions. Assange remains in custody in London's maximum security Belmarsh prison pending Biden's appeal of the denial of extradition. Thank you, Marjorie. Uh, I mean, when you put together all of those serious prosecutorial acts of misconduct, how can any prosecution proceed uh, when it is so infected and, and fatally flawed by that kind of government misconduct? I'm, that's rhetorical in part to ask that question. Uh, I hope the audience appreciates the breadth of the nefarious uh, actions this US government has taken uh, and now with the uh, aiding and abetting by the Biden administration. I want to pause, Marjorie, uh, briefly on the hacking question, because uh, some have said, in all events, uh, putting aside the Espionage Act, there is one count in the uh, Assange uh, indictment uh, under a computer hacking charge uh, that's what would add a five-year sentence uh, to his conviction. Uh, but there was testimony at the extradition hearing uh, and elsewhere uh, during the Chelsea Manning uh, prosecution. Uh, um, tell us a little bit with the time we have uh, of what the flaws are in the hacking charges that have been made against Assange. Yes, the first indictment, the, the first indictment by the Trump administration just had that one count uh, under the Computer Abuse and Fraud Act, uh, and it was based on the allegation that um, Assange had worked with Chelsea Manning to hack into uh, information that was they, they should not have was that was classified basically. Um, but sensing the weakness in that argument, um, and eventually there was testimony that refuted that argument at the extradition hearing, the Trump administration filed a superseding indictment, which included the 17 charges under the Espionage Act. But when people were up in arms all over the world about the First Amendment and prosecuting a journalist and a publisher, um, the Trump administration filed a new superseding indictment to try to beef up the hacking charge to try to paint Julian Assange as a hacker instead of a journalist. And the basis for that superseding indictment uh, that to beef up the hacking charge was based on these now discredited allegations by Thor Darson. Thank you. Well, I hope we've been able to uh, highlight the key uh, elements uh, of what now is clear to be the persecution of Julian Assange. We've got uh, 10 or 15 minutes for some questions. Uh, if you uh, can use the feature uh, in reactions to raise hands, uh, that way we'll see the hands on the screen. Uh, anyone not adept at that, uh, I will try to find your hands uh, if you raise them. Uh, but we already have uh, three questions from uh, Dave, Carol Francis, and John. Yeah, I think Dave was hand was up first if you want to go, Dave. Yes. Uh, th thank you, and th thanks for the presentation. My question 
is about the Bush, uh, the, uh, sorry, the Biden administration's recent decision not to further investigate allegations of torture. Um, can you comment on the legal uh, and political justifications for that decision in light of what you have told us about the Biden administration's decision to follow through on the Trump appeal for extradition. Thank you. Marjorie, you wanna take that? Um, I, I'm not quite sure what Dave is referring to. Can you be a little bit more specific? Uh, I know for uh, one detail is that uh, uh, at least one of the two psychiatrists or psychologists who participated and guided and engineered the torture program under the Bush administration uh, expressed a willingness to testify in a proceeding, I believe it had to do with one of the Guantanamo prisoners who uh, was found to be completely innocent but was tortured relentlessly for, for many years. Um, I, I think one of the psychologists it. was willing to testify and the Bush administration quashed that uh, investigation. Okay, uh, yes, that's the, uh, Abu Zubaida was, um, was arrested while well, he was actually captured and apprehended and, uh, sent through extraordinary rendition to the CIA black sites in uh, Thailand and Poland where he was relentlessly tortured. He was waterboarded 83 times and subjected to all kinds of torture. They, uh, the Bush administration thought he was a number three man in Al Qaeda and uh, basically Osama bin Laden's right hand man. Later the CIA admitted that Abu Zubaydah was not even a member of um, of Al Qaeda uh, in the 6,700 page report of the Select Senate Committee on Intelligence. So there is an investigation, a criminal investigation of the people in Poland who participated in the torture of Abu Zubaydah when he was there at the black site. And they are trying to get testimony from the two psychologists um, who orchestrated and uh, are, were the architects of the Bush torture policy. But the uh, during the Trump administration, oh, Pompeo, once again, Pompeo rears his ugly head, said that uh, these psychologists should not be able to testify because it violates the state secrets privilege because it would um, impact, it would harm the US um, relations with Poland. Uh, now, it's not even a question that uh, that that this torture took place in Poland. Um, the people in the Polish proceeding just want to get details about what happened to Al Abu Zubaydah and when. So uh, the hearing in the U.S. Supreme Court a couple of weeks ago um, was on this very topic. And during that oral argument, three of the justices, including Gorsuch, the right winger, said to the US government, uh, we don't even need to get to this state secrets privilege. Why don't you let Ab Ab uh, Abu Zubaydah himself testify? He was a witness to his torture. And uh, the um, solicitor general for the United States said, well, you know, he's, he's being held um, in uh, incommunicado. And, uh, and the reason I think that Abu Zubaydah has not been allowed to publicly testify is because he's probably a shell of himself from all of the vicious torture that he suffered. And by the way, he's still incarcerated at Guantanamo with, uh, Guantanamo with no charges. So um, after that oral argument, the Supreme Court, the Biden administration came back and said, well, uh, we will let Abu Zubaydah testify, but it, under very circumscribed conditions. Um, and uh, so, you know, probably not uh, publicly. And, uh, you know, we don't know what the conditions will be. But the Biden administration said that does not affect 
our assertion of the state secrets privilege, which by the way, um, was used by Bush and Obama and Trump as well to hide uh, information about extraordinary rendition, about um, the US uh, illegal spying program, et cetera. Um, and uh, so I think that's what you're talking about. Thank you. Thank you for that question, Dave. And Carol Francis, I think you're up next. Okay, um, my question is, what can we do? Um, I mean, bring charges against Pompeo for attempted murder. I mean, you talk, Marjorie, about the international protest from people throughout the world on behalf of publishers. How do we tap into that? Should we write to, to Biden? Do we try to motivate the press, educate the press? Are you ordered educating the press? What, what can we do? How can we plug into the movement? Well, thank you for that, Carol. I want to defer to Steve because that's one of the topics that he is uh, going to discuss. Well, very briefly, and I'm eager to hear Carrie and Marjorie on this. So we are in a very dynamic moment uh, with this appeal pending, which will be argued on October 27 and 28. This weekend across the nation uh, is, a, uh, is a call to action uh, to bring attention to uh, the Julian Assange prosecution. Uh, for example, tomorrow, Saturday, the 23rd at 4.30, uh, the local Assange defense uh, group, and I'm happy to see Dick and Sharon from LA Progressive here and others from the committee, uh, we are presenting what I think will be such an appealing program that links what is happening to Assange to what has happened in American history in the suppression of anyone who has the audacity to speak truth to power. The program is called From Gangster Rap to Julian Assange, the Criminalization of Art and Entertainment. Uh, I've sent the uh, announcement uh, once. I'll send it again later today. Uh, this is a fully developed and produced program at 4.30 tomorrow. Uh, it will be posted and you will be able to see it uh, beginning uh, tomorrow at 4.30 and uh, at your leisure thereafter uh, with several speakers, uh, interviews with key whistleblowers uh, hosted by Jody Armour, a law professor at USC. Uh, that program will talk about how we must put pressure on the Biden uh, Merrick Garland Justice Department to do the right thing. All they have to do is accept the British ruling denying extradition. And Julian Assange can be returned to his family, to his children, and can be begin to recuperate and recover his mental and physical health. So pressure directly at the Justice Department to Merrick Garland, uh, classic lobbying of elected officials uh, here in California, our senators and representatives, so they put pressure uh, on the administration. And uh, I would encourage once the uh, video of this program is available, we will send you that link and you can uh, distribute it because I think today's program is going to give anyone uh, a full and thorough uh, examination of this case. Steve, maybe we could put the link on our website and include it on our emails so that everybody who comes across our stuff could have access. Excellent. That'd be great. Thank you. Uh, I think, John, you had your hand up next. Yes. Um, I just wanted to. Uh, make an observation and then uh, ask Marjorie a question. Uh, the observation is um, in pursuing the prosecution uh, of Assange, I find it ironic that uh, Joe Biden is lining up with uh, Donald Trump, his opponent, rather than Barack Obama, his political patron. Uh, my question uh, for Marjorie is, uh, can you talk about um, 
the pending prosecution in Ecuador uh, of Ola Bini and what that says about the extent to which the American government is determined to destroy not just WikiLeaks, but everyone associated with it. Yes, I don't have the facts of that case at my fingertips. I know that uh, Stephen Donziger, a human rights lawyer, got a $9.5 billion judgment against Chevron in Ecuador for destroying the Amazon. And the US judicial system has been working hand in glove with Chevron um, to prosecute uh, Donziger. He was just sentenced to six months in prison for contempt, criminal contempt for refusing uh, to uh, turn over his privileged confidential attorney-client communications to Chevron. But I am not familiar with the details of the case that you mentioned. Perhaps Steve or Kerry can, uh, can shed some light on that. John, you're way ahead of us on this one. I'm not familiar with that case either. Um, I'll, I'll try to I, find I, a link. I can. Okay, I, I, thank I can. you. Kerry, go right ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All, all of me was, um, Around the time that, uh, that Assange was indicted, uh, he was arrested in, in Ecuador, I, I believe, um, for, uh, he, he was alleged, um, actually, as, as far as I know, I don't know that he's actually been uh, formally charged in, in Ecuador, um, but there was an allegation that, um, that, uh, that he was associated with, with WikiLeaks and, uh, suspicion that the U.S. was ultimately behind Ecuador's attempt uh, to go after Ola Bini. He's a, he's a very gifted uh, computer programmer and has done a lot of work uh, with human rights organizations. And his case was actually taken up by one of the uh, U.N. rapporteurs, the uh, Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, as well as various international human rights organizations like uh, Amnesty International, EFF, have all spoken out uh, against the prosecution of Bini in Ecuador. And the um, the implications it has for due process, and also the uh, overreach of computer crimes laws, uh, uh, computer crime laws, because there's been uh, really no clarity as to the actual um, allegations against him. Um, there's been a, a fishing expedition, and he's been held um, in, in confinement. I, I believe he might have. Um, yeah, yeah. So there's the EFF link um, on the case, uh, but but this issue of computer crime. Uh, laws that uh, that Steve brought up, I, I think, is also really significant because this is, I, I think, the cutting edge of, of where we're seeing the next layer of repression, where uh, the government might claim that that people are hackers. Well, okay, uh, someone's a hacker. That 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 sounds nasty and nefarious. Um, but the computer crime laws that we have in in the U.S., including the um, mainly the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which is implicated in this case, is also another. A terrible law, which I could go into another hour presentation on, um, but actually it's it's related in some ways to the Espionage Act, and there's been a lot of criticism about the use of computer crime laws to uh, limit the uh, freedom of information. So I, I encourage you to read about the Ola Bini case. Um, it's a I, I think a consequential case. Um, I haven't read up on the details, um, you know, very recently, but I think the EFF link is a good place to start. Thank you. Thank you for that. And thank you for that question, John. Um, also, I wanted to point out that uh, Nick had posted the link for the from Gangsta Rap um, conference that uh, Steve was mentioning in the in the chat, if you want to register for that. And I think, Anthony, you had your hand up next. Yeah, I first I want to thank you all for incredibly well researched, thoughtful and uh, compelling presentation. And I am embarrassed that I knew so little about this and I feel um, my eyes have been opened and it's a real concern. I'm wondering if any of you have tried to write op-ed pieces for Washington Post, New York Times, LA Times, and you know, to get this out into the public awareness. I haven't read hardly anything about it. And you presented such a compelling case that this is a threat to freedom of the press, freedom of information. Um, it's shocking that uh, so little has been said about the Espionage Act in this case in the media. 
So do you have any uh, plans to, to get this word out and have you tried and failed because the media hasn't been interested? It's been a struggle. I'll turn to my panelists in a moment. Uh, we were instrumental in Newsweek publishing a major piece. The co-chairs of the National Assange Defense Committee uh, are Alice Walker, Noam Chomsky, and Daniel Ellsberg. Uh, and Newsweek published a major piece uh, by them uh, about uh, three weeks ago. Uh, at the AssangeDefense.org, uh, various articles, statements, it has been pulling teeth to get uh, corporate media uh, to recognize, uh, even in their own interests, uh, the threat that this prosecution poses. But slowly, international journalism organizations and others uh, have been speaking out. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Marjorie and Carrie? Yes, I uh, second uh, Steve's recommendation of that Newsweek piece by um, Ellsberg, Walker, and Chomsky. It's a very, very important piece and makes parallels, draws parallels between what Julian Assange did and what Daniel Ellsberg did with the Pentagon Papers and how important it is for the American people to understand what our government is doing in our name, particularly when it has to do with illegal wars and war crimes. Um, the Corporate media, as Steve said, has virtually ignored the Assange case uh, for the last couple of years, although when he was indicted, several of the uh, editorial boards from the major newspapers, Washington Post, New York Times, USA Today, Wall Street Journal, came out with very strong statements against that indictment. We haven't heard much from them for the last two years. But when this Yahoo News article came out on January on um, September 26th, that was a real breakthrough uh, because that garnered uh, national and international attention in the corporate media about these very disturbing allegations uh, that the CIA was planning to um, kidnap and, uh, and uh, assassinate Julian Assange. Um, I and others write regularly about the case. My articles go on truthout.org and are reprinted on a number of um, alternative uh, websites. But uh, it, I, I think that the reason, one of the reasons that the corporate media, um, particularly the democratic leaning corporate media, so, so to speak, uh, has shied away from it is because of um, revelations that WikiLeaks made uh, about um, emails, the DNC emails during the presidential campaign, which many other outfits publicized as well, um, but which turned some people, uh, some liberals against Assange. But keep in mind that the reason that Assange is being indicted is from the 2010-2011 revelations of WikiLeaks of the U.S. Commission of War Crimes. Okay, hey, um, I think we have just one more question, Stephen. I think we're about out of time, so shall we just end with Geraldine's question? Good idea. Yeah, I was. Uh, I'm really, really disappointed that the Biden administration would be pursuing this, which raises the question: Why would he be, you know, doing this? Has he is has there been any justification? Uh, from his administration in terms of why he's pursuing this? Carrie, let's uh, let you take a shot at that. And then Marjorie, you're on mute. It's difficult to really know. I mean, it's, it's one of those things where I think we'll get more clarity in, we'll have the luxury of that years, maybe decades from now in the same way that we, we really see the motivations behind say the Nixon prosecutions of Ellsberg. Um, but it, I think there definitely are forces within the Justice Department, within the intelligence community that want to see an expansion uh, of the Espionage Act um, into the, the vision of, of what it was as a tool for uh, repression and dissent. And I, I think this, uh, my, 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 my own um, kind of personal speculation uh, here is, is that we're, 
witnessing uh, an effort to really stifle investigative journalism. Ah, that's Audrey. what I thought. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I agree with uh, Carrie's analysis. And I also think that on balance, um, the desire uh, in the Biden administration to uh, punish people who uh, leak evidence of US war crimes outweighs uh, its commitment, which fortunately Obama had, uh, to protecting the First Amendment right to freedom of expression and a free press. Um, and uh, Biden has uh, shown himself to uh, pursue a number of the policies of the Trump administration uh, on immigration, for example, on asylum, uh, on, on a number of things. Uh, has been much more timid than Barack Obama, who certainly um, did his share of, uh, of uh, criminal activity, including torturing uh, prisoners at Guantanamo by force feeding them when they went on hunger strike. Uh, none of them have clean hands. It's very distressing to see Biden not following through with Obama's position on this and allowing uh, this appeal and pursuing this appeal um, against Julian Assange. Well, I'll just wrap it up by agreeing with my friends. I think we can never ignore the institutional uh, tendency to suppress information. Information is a threat to established governments. Uh, and that's uh, no less true in the case of the uh, Obama, the uh, Biden administration. There's an institutional sense to on uh, Merrick Garland's uh, uh, situation. And we're gonna have to watch how effectively he uh, prosecutes others uh, with the same uh, of the January 6th uh, insurrection with the same tenacity that they are prosecuting a truth teller like Julian Assange. Uh, I think that's been the purpose of today's program uh, to elevate this case uh, to your attention uh, I'm so grateful to Marjorie and, and Carrie for a truly extraordinary uh, in-depth presentation. Uh, I'm, I can see the comments in the chat in that respect. Uh, I'm very grateful to each of you personally. Uh, and I'm grateful to ICUJP for having the time and the platform uh, to focus on this important issue. Uh, I hope people will take it upon themselves uh, to simply contact the Justice Department, to call on Merrick Garland to the extent he purports to be an independent uh, attorney general uh, to end this prosecution, whether he cites humanitarian grounds, First Amendment grounds, uh, or due process grounds, uh, this fatally flawed prosecution must end. Uh, I thank everybody for joining us today.